Okay. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you very much to Zev and to Torah Metzion for um, arranging this incredible opportunity uh, to be able to address you from uh, here in my uh, house in Modi'in. I'm looking out at, the, at Modi'in, very quiet today. Uh, everybody's at home. Everybody is uh, in, being in, with family. It is an amazing time. Uh, the uh, Kodesh Baruch has given us that right before Pesach, in this few weeks leading up to Pesach, in which we're going to speak about uh, the importance of having a family and uh, telling our children and our grandchildren, maybe for some of us listening, our great-grandchildren, the story of Pesach, here we have an opportunity to be at home with our families or to uh, have to be able to communicate with our families in this uh, high-tech uh, generation in which we're able to do so remotely uh, and to be able to, to spend time uh, doing things that generally wouldn't do. But uh, the, of course, the show must go on and the and Torah must go on. And therefore, we are here, of course, uh, recording um, uh, uh, the Shi'ur and be able to share it with you. The, the biggest problem, I, I Baruch Hashem spent some time doing other Shi'urim uh, in this fashion. The biggest problem, of course, is where to sit because you want to make sure that you have a background that isn't embarrassing, that you're not uh, looking up at uh, hundreds of things outside that are that people can see exactly the balagan you have in your house. So hopefully, concentrate on me and don't look at the balagan behind us and everything will be okay. So uh, when I was thinking, what are we going to teach today? There is a fascinating Gemara in Masechet Brachot. And since in this shiur, we're learning Rav Kook's Einaya, uh, Rav Kook's explanation of the uh, Agadic portions of the... Uh, of the um, uh, the Gemara, this uh, I thought that this very very short few lines, Rukuk has a very interesting message, and I think a message that is appropriate as much as it was in the time of the Gemara, it's appropriate today. Of course, we could not have a shield without mentioning the Corona, without mentioning the COVID nineteen, and the special situation this has created for us. Uh, here in Israel and of course all over the world where people are watching and people will be seeing the shiur at a later time Bezrat Hashem um, my son said to me yesterday that if we'd have invested the amount of time in finding a cure as we have of making jokes about coronavirus then we would have long time ago found the cure I said it to one of my balabatim and I was taking a calling around my balabatim and make sure everybody's well and one of my balabatim said yes but the difference is that to find a cure is not in my hands. That I can't do anything about. Making jokes that I can do. So we, um, we the Jewish people, uh, have been able to utilize this time to be able to, uh, to do what we can, to make jokes, etc. But also to have very, very severe restrictions on our movements. And what's fascinating in the Gemara in Masechet Brachot says a similar idea about a particular uh, group of people, uh, or two groups of people we're going to look at, that also has particular ways of, react, of behaving that a Kodesh Baruch Hu praises them. We're going to see in the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, Davchet Amud Bet, you have received the Dapei Mekorot. And if not, we'll read them here. It's a very few lines in the Gemara. The Gemara says the following. The Gemara, as we said, Davchet Amud Bet, Masechet Brachot. Tanya, Amar Am Gamliel, L'shlosha devarim ohev ani et... Sorry, before, before. Tanya, Amar Rabbi Alekiva, L'shlosha devarim ohev ani et amadayim. Says Rabbi Akiva, there are three things that the Madaim, the Madians do, that I like. Oh, in fact, not I like what they do. I like the Madians. I like the Madai because they do three things that are very, very worthy, that are very praiseworthy. What do they do? When they cut the meat, they do not cut it on themselves or they don't cut it in the air. They cut it on the table. I only cut meat on the table. When they kiss each other, when they kiss each other, they only kiss on the back of the hand. And when they give eitza, when they discuss with each other, they only do it in the field. Says Rav Ada, where do we learn a verse? What verse do we have to support Rabbi Akiva's idea that the Medeans do this, that this is recommended, that this is from, that this is, Praiseworthy. Yaakov called Leah and Rachel to the field to 
his flock. And here you see that Yaakov called Le'an Rachel to the field. That's where he had the discussion with them. And therefore, that is a praiseworthy thing to do. And the Medeans, the, the, uh, the tribe of Madai, or the people that lives in the city of the, of the uh, Medina of Madai, they did the same thing. That when they wanted to have an important conversation, they would do so in the field. So we see in the Gemara three things that Madai did that were praiseworthy. Before we understand what they all were, and before we later see Rav Cook's explanation in Enaya, it is worth thinking about who Madai. Now we met Madai not so far, not so long ago. Parasu Madai were the um, were the nations that enslaved the Jewish people on a on a at least on a on a moral level during the story of Esther, Mordechai and Esther. And we, uh, we, met, we not only did we see them, but we also, and we met them, we also very much celebrated on Purim. Again, Purim was a little bit less, uh, a little bit more challenging than in previous years, but still we weren't to the point that we're going to have at the moment that this Shabbat will be even more challenging in our uh, restrictions on movement. But, but uh, Purim, we celebrated overcoming Madai. Madai were bad people. Madai were people who we wanted to get away from. So much so that we mentioned in the previous shiur that the Gemara says that one of the reasons that we do not recite Hallel on Purim were, is because the, in the end of the Purim story, we still remain Avdei Achashverosh, Eved. We are slaves to, <coughs> to Achashverosh. The idea that Achashverosh enslave the poor people. That's the, that's the, the, the Lashon of the Gemara. That's the Gemara says. It doesn't say that we lived in Madai or Pras, that we were inhabitants there. We were Avdei Achashverosh. And so in the same way that we have a deliverance that we are looking forward to in Pesach, a deliverance from slavery of the Egyptians, there's also a delivery of the slavery from Parasu Madai. And so the Madian, and we'll see in a moment, the Parsim, were not the good friends of the Kodesh Baruch Hu, were not the good friends of the Jewish people. And yet Rabbi Akiva comes and says, even though the Madain, the, the Madians were bad people, were not people that we want to praise or commend, we still find within them, there were three things that they did that are commendable, that we can learn from, that we can adopt, that we can praise them for. And that's, I think, a very interesting thing, because many times when we look at our enemies or we look at the people who are not uh, our, our, our community, we like to um, not only distance ourselves from them and not only see that they're bad, but we, it's very hard for us to find the positive traits that they have. And yet the Gemara says, even Madai, and we'll see in a moment, Paras, who were the enslavers of the Jewish people, we are not at all problem, uh, find it problematic to find positive things that they did, to find things that we can emulate, that we can praise that they are doing. And I think it's a very important idea, is that when we look at our enemies, our enemies may be those who enslave us, may be those who kill us, may be those who threaten us, but that doesn't necessarily detract from our ability to find the positive in every single person, and even in every single nation, and every single society, that there, each society will have things that are positive that we can learn from them. And here the Gemara says, Rabbi Akiva, who says, I learned something from the Madaim. I learned something from them that maybe they have that I don't have. That maybe they are better than the Jewish people. Maybe they're things that we have to try to copy for them, to try to emulate with them. So what are the three things that we say? The three things that were the following. Rabbi Akiva said the three things that Madai had were, they cut the meat on the table and not anywhere else. The Rashi doesn't necessarily explain exactly what, uh, what the idea of that was. But maybe we'll see in Rav Kook that it's an idea of a certain amount of danger. There's a place where you cut the meat and you don't cut it in other places. Continues the, other, the next thing. When they kiss each other, or when they shake hands, they would do that only al gavayad. Says Rashi, why al gavayad? Amazing idea, Rashi says. It sounds familiar. Let's hear what he says. When they would kiss their friend's hand, you know, you take a hand and you kiss a person's hand. That's something that is very common in certain communities. Uh, we, would we would 
I liken that to shaking hands possibly, but in many communities it is appropriate to kiss the person's hand. When they would do so, when they would kiss their friend's hand, do shek, that's an important, that's to give a credence, that is to show our allegiance, like we shake hands with someone, we shake hands to show that we are connected to them, that we have a physical connection with them, and therefore that's a chashivud, that gives them credence, that gives them importance, and when they would shake hands, what would they do? They would kiss the hand, not on the front of the hand, but on the back of the hand, says Rashi, why? Because of the spit, because of the saliva. We know that the illnesses can pass from saliva. That's exactly the illness that we're in at the moment. That is possibly that it passes from the saliva one to the other. And therefore, a long time ago, we stopped shaking hands. We were very worried about one of the restrictions that we had was the ability to shake hands because we're worried that it will pass from one person to another. Here the Gemara says, that is something we learned from the Madaim. I.e., this idea of the restriction of shaking hands, which has already been in effect for a few weeks and has now been become even more that we have to have social distancing so because we're afraid of the saliva, we're afraid of the, the, of the spread of this disease uh, among people through, saliva, through the medium of saliva. That already, says Rabbi Kiva, we should praise, we should praise the Madaim for that. And in fact, if we maybe would have kept like the Madaim and not kiss each other, not ha- ha- shaken hands forever, then we, would not, we wouldn't pass diseases from one to another. Mm-hmm. The last thing they do, very, very appropriate to our, very interesting that the Gemara says that, uh, related to our situation. And when they gave uh, counsel to one another, when they wanted to have something important to discuss with each other, they would only do that in the field. And that brings the Gemara in that pasuk that, was, uh, that Yaakov also called his, <coughs> his wives to him, when he wanted to speak to them about leaving uh, Midian and going back to Eretz Israel, he did that in the field. Why in the field, says Rashi? The Amre Inshe, because people say, Oznaim the Kotel, the walls have ears. That's a very famous uh, uh, expression that it comes originally from here, that the Oznaim the Kotel, that's a Pasuk already Mishle, that the walls have ears, and therefore uh, we have to be careful where we share information. You remember in the First World War in, the, in England, there were many, many uh, um, uh, posters up to say, you know, be careful who you speak with because the wolves have ears. People listen. The enemy is listening. And therefore, if you want to have something important, you have to go to the Sadeh, go to somewhere private. That now makes sense to the Pasuk that we saw from Yaakov. The Yaakov says to his, do- to his wives, I want to tell you something very important, but I don't want your, husband to- I don't want your husband, father to hear. And I don't want your brothers to hear. And therefore, let's go to a place which is private. El Sono, to his own personal Sadeh, his own personal flock, that there he can assume that no one else is listening. And therefore, they would be able to share this uh, incri- vital information. So that's the first part of the Gemara. The Gemara continues. Tanya, Amaram Gamliel. And Gamliel says, There are three things that are like the Persians for. Again, even before we see what they were, what they are, or what they were, that Rabbi Gamliel recommended the Persians. The Persians are generally not considered to be the good friends of the Jewish people, not in the past and not today. And the idea that we can find a positive element of the Persians, that we can find what the Persians did that was praiseworthy, that's a very interesting thing, something we can learn from as well, that we shouldn't, if we, if we see among our enemies, among those who are different from us, among those who... who even those who attack us, but we can find a good trait there. We need to know how to praise that and to see that and to recognize it. What were they? Says the Gemara, they eat in a tsanua way. They eat in a way that is humble. They do it quietly. They don't, they don't make big uh, celebrations. They, are pri- they, are, they show humility in the bathroom. So when they're the Persian bathroom, uh, is, is already discussed in the Gemara in other places that it is a place where everybody went individually and unlike many uh, previous societies in which the bath in which the bathroom or the toilet or the place where people went to defecate were much more open were in this were in the fields and therefore they had actual bathrooms they actually have bathhouses where people went to defecate to urinate and that therefore it's not it's new that's something we can learn from them we should also be tanua when we go to the bathroom the Snuim Bedavarche, and they also would Snuim Bedavarche, says Rashi, that talks about Tashmish, that their uh, personal relations, their intimate personal relations, were in a very uh, private and a very closed way, 
but possibly also unlike other communities. Continues the Gemara. Ani tziviti lemekudashai. The pastuk in Yeshaya, I commanded my holy ones. Tani Rav Yosef, ele palsim. These are the Persians. Amekudashim, that they are my holy ones, says the Gemara. Amekudashim umuzumanim legehinom. That they are mekudashim. Mekudashim doesn't mean only that they are holy, but also that they are set aside, as in the as in the verse that we say, or the Amira that we said at a wedding. Hariat mekudeshedli. It doesn't mean you are holy to me. It means you are separated to me. Hariat mekudeshedli, but tabat zokadat Moshe Yisrael. You are separated from me. You are you are aside from the other men who can now not marry you. So therefore, the mekudashim in this sense, means that they were separated, they were aligned, they were assigned umuzumanim, and they were invited legehinum, to go to hell. Says Rashi, Anitziviti mekudashai betfilat bavel ketiv anitziviti et malchei pras umidai lavo lashchita. Says Rashi, it says, when the bavel fell, the pasuk in Yeshaya, when Babylon fell, there, uh, it says, I commanded the kings of Persia and the kings of Madai, the exactly people we just spoke about, to come to destroy them. So I set them aside to come to destroy them. So the last piece of Gemara seems to suggest that there's nothing good about the Persians. You just praise the Persians and the Medins, the Madai and Paras. You say they do these wonderful things that we maybe should emulate. And comes the Gemara and says, <laughs> that's not true. That in fact, they're, they are going to go to hell. They're going to be destroyed. As Rashi, as Rashi says, Lashkita, they're going to be destroyed. Possibly we could suggest there's not a stira here. There is no contradiction between the beginning of the Gemara and the end of the Gemara. The begin, end of the Gemara says, Madai and Paras are not going to live forever. The Persian Empire and the Median Empire are going to fall. However, that doesn't detract from the things that we, from the fact that we can still learn from them. We can still learn something. We can still have an idea or the ideas that we can learn from Persia, that we can learn from Madai, from Medians, we can still learn things from them. The fact that they are uh, part of God's world, even though they are going eventually to be destroyed, they are eventually going to be uh, ex uh, exercised, they're going to be uh, rejected, they're going to be hell ridden. Still, in the meantime, we can learn things from them. There are things that we can learn from them. So, so I wanted to, so that's the Gemara. So I wanted to look at how does Rav Kook explain that Gemara. And in Einaya, a very, very short and a very concise way of explaining it. Um, and the first part of the Gemara, the last part of the Gemara, Rav Kook explains that, and you don't have it on your sheet or you don't have it in front of you, but um, I'd explain, just read it inside. The idea that the Persians with Sanua in the way they ate, in the way they that they defecated in the way that they had relations, the says Rav Kook, the busha, humility, and sniut, but in the in the physical sense. Look at the thing, three things that Rami Gamliel praised the Persians for was eating, defecating, and having relations and having sexual relations. That's very an, an animalistic part of the human being. It's not doesn't say the way that they they interacted with each other, doesn't say the way that they prayed, doesn't say the way that they they thought. Those are things that are very physical, and those physical, maybe even animalistic things, to find their humility and to be private and to be tsanua, that is a sign, says Rav Kook, on the development of a special level of a human being, of, of humanity, um, in their intelligence and in their character. So that makes sense. Persia, even though the Persians we don't see necessarily in the book of Esther as being the most refined and uh, humble people. Still, the Gemara seems to find within them a, an ability to find within something there that shows their development as human beings, shows the development of human society. And it's true that Persian society did develop some of these things. We said the toilet that we have today was very much developed uh, originally in Persian society. And um, the idea of, of this, it's new, of having cubicles which were private, that's an, a Persian idea. And that's something that we can learn from Persia, even though they're not necessarily uh, are good friends, 
because that's Malat Adam, that shows the a level of a man. But what I wanted to look at is Rav Kook's explanation of the first three things that Rabbi Kiva said. You'll recall that Rabbi Kiva said that the Medeans have three ma'alot that are important. The first is that they cut the, the meat only on the table. The second is when they shake hands and they kiss the hand, they only kiss the back of the hand, not the front of the hand, because of the saliva. And the third thing that we said was that they have counsel when they, when they discuss how to uh, run the, 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 the cities or how to, be, how to have counsel of, of important political affairs. They do so in private. They do so in the, in the, city, in the uh, field out of a fear that other people will hear, will hear them who should not be hearing. As, they, as Rashi said, Oznaim the, the walls have ears. But if Cook explains, these three things are three levels of concern that we have of making a perfection in our world. Yeah. We could ask at the moment, it's very clear to all of us that the restrictions that we're having, that the, uh, the limitation on our movement, the limitation on our human interaction, the limitation on our ability to act because of the coronavirus, it limits us. And uh, just imagine, I was thinking about it today when I was coming back from shul, that you know we have a very, very small minyan in an open place. We only have 10 people. We distance for two, two meters from each other. We have no human interaction. We don't shake hands at the end. We don't want to speak to each other. We want, when we walk around in the street or we go to a store to get something, very small amount of time we interact, we're suddenly having no human interaction. And that the importance of the human reaction of the hello, of the face shaking hands, of the maybe a hug, maybe a, 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 a sitting and down and, and sharing a meal together or sharing a coffee together or sharing time together is very, very limited. I went to yesterday, my parents, uh, uh, I, I did some, some shopping and I had to take it for them. And there's no, we can't have any physical interaction. That very much limits us. And why would we have that? Why? What, what exactly was supposed to learn from that? Rav Kook says in the, in the following passage, he explains what was Rabbi Akiva praising about the Madin. Let's see it inside. When they cut the meat, they only do it on the table. When they kiss, they only do it on the back of the hand. They only uh, give counsel in the field. Shlosha. Mm-hmm. Says Rav Kook, there are three circles of the way that we live. There are three circles of influence that we have in all of our different parties, in all of our different interactions. But when we think of any interaction between ourselves and others, it happens on three levels, on three different spheres of influence. What are they? That it would be appropriate that anybody who is intelligent would, would notice, would, would, would see, to be aware of any possible stumbling block, of any possible way that those things could go wrong. There are three spheres that we have, we'll explain in a moment, and in those three spheres, there are potential pitfalls. There are potential problems that can happen. And therefore, we have to be aware. We have to be, a, we have to be a, a alert to be careful not to fall into the pitfalls, fall into the traps that each of those spheres enable, uh, 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 places before us. What are the three circles of sphere? B'chaya bayit, b'chaya mishpacha, b'chaya medin. The life in our houses, the life in our families, and the lives in our communities, in our cities, or in our countries. Chaya Medina. There is my personal life. Chaya Bayit. What happens in my house? There's Chaya Mishpacha. There's my family. There's a social interaction within a family. And there's also the political workings of the government, of the, of the city, of the country and maybe even interactions between countries. And a human being is involved in all of those three spheres. In the sphere of the personal, of the, of the house, of the way we act in our, in our, inside my own place, my own Daladamo. There is the place that we act within our family, our interaction with family, with closer family and 
maybe even wider family. And it's a place that we interact with a community in our city. Rav Cook says each of these three has a potential pitfall. A person's interaction with themselves, obviously, can have physical danger. It can also have spiritual danger. A person's interaction with others, with family, with between husband and wife, between children and parents, between wider family, has its own potential pitfalls, its own place in which that can lead us to do things that are problematic, both halakhically, physically, spiritually, and our interaction with the community. Our interaction with community can be something that is wonderful, but it can also be something that is very dangerous. Communities can become uh, places in which we all as a community do something bad. All as a community, the community leads us to do, to do bad things. And we said, we mentioned before, that the Gemara says in Masechet Ketubot, that anybody who lives in Chutzlart is as though they have no God. Right. What do you mean? As it possible? So the answer is, as according to the Tosafot, that when a person lives in a city, in a city or in a country, that part of their taxes goes to place for things that are against the Torah, I have supported those things. I.e., that living in that community has led me to do something that I don't want to do, but led me to do a bad thing. The opposite is also true. That a person's in their own life, in their own person, in their own in their own house, I have the ability to soar, I have the ability to 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 succeed, to excel, excel, etc. The same with a family. The same, of course, in communities. When we live without community, and where some of us now are experiencing that at the moment, to pray without the community, or to interact, or to we're uh, uh, embarking on, or trying to think about how can we celebrate the chagim, how can we celebrate Pesach alone without a community we realize the importance the critical importance of community but of course there's also a critical danger of community and therefore says Rav Cook, these three places of interaction require our thought process our understanding our care how to bring out the best that they can offer and not to bring out the bad things they can offer and that's incredibly essentially important to understand how we can use these interactions for the positive and not for the negative. And that's maybe part of what we're thinking about at the moment. And so let's understand how Rav Kuk explains the Gemara and we will narchiv on it. And therefore Rabbi Akiva said, you know, the Medeans are very fascinating because the Medeans have only understood that these three interactions, these three spheres are potentially dangerous no, he's spoken about physically here, not necessarily, not necessarily spiritual, spiritually. And therefore, our obligation, or they saw as an obligation, was to put certain limitations, certain restrictions over interaction, those three places, in order to be saved from the potential danger. What are they? Therefore, they, the Medeans, are very careful. That's why Rabbi Kiyah praised them. What were they careful about? Uh, when they cut the meat, they only do it on the table. It says, what's cutting the meat? They were careful how they cut meat, not to do it in the air, not to damage themselves, maybe not to get infection in the meat. They did that in a way that was the limited danger. They cut it only on the table. That, how I cut meat, is how I interact in my own personal sphere. It wasn't talking necessarily about uh, a butcher, about a public sphere. How do I act when I prepare my own food? And preparing my own food, <laughs> but now we are, so we're so, we, we understand exactly the dangers of what can happen in my own home, how I'm able to introduce into my own home danger and therefore the Medeans were very careful how they cut the meat what's cutting the meat how they acted in their own place in their own daladamot in their own sphere that's one Mishum Sakana because there was a danger Kishahim Noshkim the second level when they kissed hands they shook hands remember with each other they kissed the hand instead of kissing the front of the hand they kissed the back of the hand sort of reminds us of you know the the, the etiquette of kissing the back of a woman's hand, or we say we sign that sometimes in, in Sephardi communities, when you shake someone's hand, take it back, you kiss your own hand as a symbol of kissing them, kindle of your, of your connection with them. 
the kissing the hand, the shaking hands, relates to how it, it relates to the family life of those who are clear, uh, cl uh, uh, close and beloved. The interaction as a family, the interaction in maybe not family in the small sense of my husband and wife, but in the sense of a maybe more extended family of cousins, of aunts, uncles, of grandparents and grandchildren, great-grandparents and great-grandchildren. The interaction in shaking hands and hugging and kissing is shows people who are close to me. That's already added my own daladamot. The what, how I behave at home, how I cut the meat is my own sphere. How I shake hands is a limited sphere. That's not in the political uh, arena. That's not in the public arena. That's in our communal, in our smaller arenas. The Rav Kuk calls the family, the relationship with the family. Therefore, in that place, they were very careful of the specific, of the very specific uh, pitfall of of contagious diseases. The Rav Kuk wrote that uh, well before we had these restrictions. You know, the, I'm, I'm sure that many of you have seen that there's a tshuva going around on the WhatsApp of um, Rabbi Akiva Ege. Rabbi Akiva Ege, there was a magifa, there was a, a, uh, a plague in, uh, in Posen, in his city, um, many, many years ago, maybe 200 years ago, when there, a little less, when Rabbi Akiva Ege was there. And he, met, he set several restrictions that we should have in order not to, um, not to get sick. One that was very similar to what we have now that people shouldn't go out, people should uh, not daven in, in large communities, there were only 10 or 15 people davening each time, uh, washing hands, uh, cleanliness, and he gave the ability, or he gave permission to those who uh, uh, saw other people breaking those restrictions to be able to tell them to the authorities. Very, very, very relevant to the day. But the biggest outbreak, of course, uh, uh, was about 100 years ago, Spanish flu. Spanish flu lasted from January 1918, until December 1920. And they saw recently a, 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 um, a little video explaining about, so, about social distancing, about our own um, uh, iso self-isolation for many of us or imposed isolation for mm -hmm. some of us, that the, um, that the um, uh, uh, compared two cities, city of Philadelphia and the city of St. Louis. When the flu started in Philadelphia, they still had huge rallies and they still continued having sporting events, etc. And there was a huge peak of people who died. Whereas in St. Louis, that they understood and they closed down the hospital, closed down all public events, closed down all social gatherings, of course, many less people died. That understanding that there is, that there are machalot matapkot, there are contagious diseases, doesn't, according to Rav Kook, doesn't start 100 years ago. It started, and doesn't start with a Ricky Vega. It started already with Madai. That Madai understood that we can pass disease from one to another by shaking hands. And therefore he wrote, and therefore the Rabbi Kiva says, I praise the Medeans who understood that. Mm -hmm. Rav Kook says, but that's a very specific thing. Because it's in a very specific sphere. In what sphere? In the family sphere. Not in my personal sphere. In my personal sphere, I need to maintain a high level of personal hygiene. I need to maintain a, a care about where I, who I come to, where I go out, how do I, how do I touch them. That's the cutting the meat. But the second sphere is how do I interact with others that in a ben adam le, le chavero level. And that the Madians were very careful, not when they shook hands, that they would only kiss on the back of the hand. They wouldn't put their hands, that they just touch other people into their mouth. Almost exactly what Mr. Abrud have been telling us for the past few weeks and the other, the other health organizations worldwide have been telling us. Here, the Madians already had that. And therefore, Rav Kook says, that's why Rabbi Akiva praised the Medians. The Medians understood, Madai understood that here was a situation, here was a community that had a high level of understanding of hygiene as a community, as a family. That's the second level. The last level says Rav Kook, Al Kain ain't no shkim ki imaligabeya. Therefore, they only kiss the back of the hand and not the front of the hand. And when they had counsel, what is the counsel? The most important counsel, this doesn't mean how did they uh, interact with each other when they had to tell you a secret, I have to tell you a secret. But it was talking specifically 
about things on a level, on a political level. That you know, we have here Yoed Sim. Of course, we see the misibot itonaim of the uh, of the government talking. And now maybe it's a little bit we're a little bit limited because they're not allowed to touch each other. But often you see, you know, someone coming up and whispering something into the ear of the particular um, politician who's saying. And there have been, of course, many, many fascinating um, events in which certain uh, politicians had said things into not knowing that there was a microphone that was recording them. I.e., says Rav Cook, the, the personal secrets that they have between me and, and my family that I, I, I will listen to her and not listen to her, that's not really the Ikaritsa. Ikaritsa is... How do we talk about things that are on a geopolitical importance? How do we talk about things that have a, mid, that have a, a, a national significance? The Pasuk in Melachim, in Melachim Bet, in Perik Yudchet, Pasuk Chav says, The advice and, and power for war, i.e. Eitsa is how do is an interaction between politicians. And there, and they understood, that's what, what was the pasuk that the, that the Gemara brought in? The, the pasuk that the Gemara brought in was Yaakov telling his, his wives that what? They're going to go back to Israel. We're going to leave Midian. We're going to go back to Israel. And of course, that was the continuation of Jewish people on a national level. That already has a national significance. And we can imagine that if ya- Lavan had heard <laughs> Ya- Yaakov is about to escape. He would have stopped him. He would have done things that would have that would have changed the course of his of, of Jewish history. And therefore, Yaakov had to have that a conversation in the field. It's actually very fascinating. Before we continue with Cook, that Yaakov, God says to him, "You have to go back home." Anochi el bet el. I am the God of bet el. That you anointed me there. You have to go home. You have to go home. Go back. And what does Yaakov say? He calls his wives and he says, what do you think? Should we go back or not? Now, if you understand the pshat of that pasuk, the pshat of the pasuk is that Leah and Rachel could have said, mm, no, we like it here. We, let's stay here. Why do we want to go there? We haven't, we, we, we're not from there. We don't know it. We don't know what's going on there. Why do we want to go back there? What does Yaakov say? What does Yaakov therefore take counsel with him? God told you to do it. Why do you ask that? I think the answer is, and if we understand Rav Cook's explanation here of that, of the Madai, which is related to the Pasuk, is that Yaakov understands that here's a change in the, history, in the course of history. That here is not only affecting Yaakov, the individual, that me, Yaakov, I'm going to be here, I'm going to live here, but he understands that from here, we end the Galut of being in Midian, and we're going to go back home. And that has to be a, a, not only something that he does as a human being, or he does as an individual, he does as even in God's, uh, as God's instruction. But he understands that that's something that we as a, as a, as a Jewish people, the Jewish people at the time was, uh, yeah, was uh, Rachel, Leah, Zilha, Bilha, and their children. That was the Jewish people. We as a Jewish people have to make that decision. We have to go out. We have to decide. We are now leaving. And therefore, this is going to have national significance. Rav Kook says that's Itza. Itza is things that have a national significance. And therefore, that is a completely different sphere. Says and in those things, the Eitzal, the Milchama, to go to war, not to go to war, to have interactions with, with, uh, with other countries, to have interactions, uh, 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 how do we allocate funds, and anything else to deal with the national political level, the most important, we need to be, we need to be careful that that quiet spies, like the Meraglei Cheresh of Yoshua, who sent in Meraglei Cheresh, as opposed to the Meraglim that Moshe Rabbeinu sent, who were very loud, who made a lot of noise about it. The Meraglei Cheresh, they needed to, we want to be careful that they don't hear. I, we don't want to hear spies to hear such a thing. And therefore, and therefore, when they had those consultations, that was only in the field. It was not in, uh, in the parliament. It wasn't in places where People could hear. Rav Kook now take those, those three ideas that Rabbi Akiva praises the Madaim and takes it to a completely different sphere. Says, Rabbi, says Rav Kook, understand what Rabbi Akiva saw in the Madians. Madians, they weren't such a wonderful people. The Madians are not very, are great friends. But look what they were conscious of. They understood the Madians, something that we have to learn, says Rabbi Akiva. And, and, and it's very appropriate, and we'll see in a moment why Rabbi Akiva says that. 
we have to understand the importance of our personal sphere. What do we, how do we act in the personal sphere? What do I do in the personal sphere to be healthy? What do I do in the personal sphere to be religiously healthy? What do I do in the personal sphere to be active? What do I do in my personal sphere? What does my life look like? When I come to think, what am I doing in my life that is potentially dangerous on a physical level, on a spiritual level, on a religious level? How can I be careful of those things? Then my conscious understanding of that, I will become a better individual. I'll become a better person. That's one level. The second level, says Rav Kook, is to think of my family life. What is my, and, we'll, and I will extend it, but the Shutosha Rav Kook, I'm sure he would allow us to do so, to the community. What does my community look like? What are the potential pitfalls in my community? How can I make a better community? That's already out of my individual. That's already us as a community, or as Rav Kook calls it here, a family. There are dangers that are going to occur in a family. Uh, the most simple one that Rav Kook says here is the shaking hands and getting Machalam and Abeket, getting a contagious disease. It's a very dangerous thing. We're seeing it now. We are in the middle of it. That's why we're having this very fun, fascinating um, forum in which we're having this year. I can see some of you here uh, listening. I'm missing you. And, and you know, it's a, it's a strange experience to be able to have this interaction. But we're having, because we're worried of, of, of Machalam and Abeket in a communal sense, in a sense of, in a sense of, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we make a better community, a more healthy community on a physical level, but also on a spiritual level? That's the second level. The third level is, a, is already how do we look at a country? How does our country, what are the pitfalls of the country? What is important for our country? What is not important? What is our danger? What is our physical danger? What's our spiritual danger? And therefore, how can we be careful of them? And what Rabbi Akiva praised the Madians for, what Rabbi Akiva praised Madai was, Madai recognized that. Madai recognized that there are dangers on a physical level, on a, on, a, on a personal level, on a family level, and on a communal level. And therefore, Madai were careful that when they cut meat, that's a personal thing, it's what I do for myself, they did it only on the table. When they shook hands, they only did that and cussed on the back of the hand. They didn't kiss the front of the hand out of a fear of passing uh, illness from one to another, mm-hmm. and when they, and when they, uh, mm-hmm. when they had national things that were on national importance, i.e., when they took Eitzah, they only did it in the field and not in the palace, not in the places where other people could hear. Fascinating idea here, because we understand that Rabbi Akiva saw that. Let's understand Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was at a very, very essential time for the Jewish people. Merit of Bakoch. The, the destruction, remember the Gemara tells us, the Rabbi Kiva survived the destruction of the temple and lived half his life before destruction, half his life after destruction. What does the Gemara want to tell us? The Gemara wants to tell us that Rabbi Akiva mm-hmm. straddled an incredible, an incredible catastrophe in the Jewish people. And Rabbi Akiva was one of the great leaders who was able to weather that storm, was able to overcome the destruction of the temple, to live before the destruction of the temple, during the destruction, and post-destruction. That's something we can't even fathom. That, uh, the, moment, the closest we maybe got to there was the terrible uh, Holocaust, and people who survived, who knew the Europe before the Holocaust, and had seen it, you know, what, what had happened afterwards, and were able to come to build a new land. Rabbi Kiva, in his own personal life also, remember the Gemara Masechet Yevamot that tells us that Rabbi Akiva's own students died. We're about to enter after Pesach, we'll enter into Sfirat Omer, and we will, uh, uh, rec- we will uh, remember the students of Rabbi Akiva who died from Pesach until Atzeret. They fight from Pesach until Shavuot. What did, what, and what did Rabbi Akiva's response? He went south and he taught new Talmudim. Rabbi Akiva in many in places in his life, could have said, enough, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm, I've had it. On a personal level, what does God want from me? I die, I, 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 so I had the temple, I lost it. I had students, they died. What do you want from me? Enough, die. And Rabbi Akiva, on a personal level, continued his, his own, Rabbi Akiva's wife, two of his wives died. Uh, and on a personal level, he went and married again. I, Rabbi Akiva understood that, uh, that my sphere, my ability to succeed is going to have to happen on a personal level. It's going to happen on a place and where, where am I? Where am I in this story? Rabbi Kiva in, a, in his community. His community was his Talmudim. His community was his, 
his uh, own personal life, in which we said that to his son, Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha, and his wives who died, his interaction, remember the very famous story of Rabbi Akiva, when he, died, when he goes to study Torah, he leaves his wife, and she is left alone for 24 years. In the middle, after 12 years, he comes back, and his wife, he hears, overhears his wife, Osman Lakotel, he overhears his wife talking to a friend and saying, um, uh, she says to him, I'm sure you're very sad, you're very lonely. She says, no, if you can continue to learn another 12 years, I would, I would support him. He goes back and learns again. Rabbi Kiva has a, very fun, has a very interesting interaction in a family level. But Rabbi Kiva also has an interaction on a, on a political level. Rabbi Kiva is one of the great supporters of Bar Kochva. Rabbi Kiva says that Bar Kochva is potentially the Mashiach. Rabbi Akiva has that interaction that we're going to read about soon on Lela Seder with the Hamishah HaChamim B'Bnei Brak in Rabbi Akiva's uh, uh, home in which they discuss, according to many of the Mepharshim, they discuss the merit, they discuss this, um, this uh, rebellion against the Romans and how they're going to weather it and what it's going to look like. How's, it going to, how's their Jewish people going to look like? Rabbi Akiva saw in the Medeans in the predecessors to him, these were, this was a galut well before the galut that he was in. We are in the galut of Rome. We are the, the continuation of Rabbi Akiva, the galut of Rome. But Rabbi Akiva saw that in the Medeans, in the previous, in the previous galut, in the galut of the end of the Bait Rishon and beginning of Bait Shani. He saw the Medeans had learned this idea of, find, of being careful, of, find, of realizing the potential danger on a personal level, on a communal level and a national level. And therefore, Rabbi Akiva said, hmm, how am I going to build a Kodesh Baruch Hu? How am I going to connect to a Kodesh Baruch Hu? How am I going to get to a place in which we can overcome these potential pitfalls? Rabbi Akiva saw that on a personal level, on a communal level, and on a national level. That's Rabbi Akiva, that's the Gemara, that's Rav Kuk. Very short, it's a very short passage. But I think it's a great message here for us as well. Because at the moment, we, the Jewish people, and we, the world, we, the inhabitants of the world, are in this very, very complex situation. There's very, there's very severe restrictions in many, many countries. Baruch Hashem, Zachino, those of you in Israel that listen to us in Israel, or will listen to Israel. Zachino, that in Israel, we have had an incredible leadership that has been able to be very, very restrictive. Uh, from the beginning and, and not allow it not to ignore the danger from the beginning but really from the beginning to see the potential danger the potential uh, uh, p physical danger personal danger and has therefore severely restricted us from the beginning it's not in, it's not nice for us we prefer not to be that case however we understand that here is great potential that if a Kodesh Baruch Hu sent us something that attacks us on these three levels on these three spheres and personally at, 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 at danger I'm commonly a danger and I'm nationally a danger, then we understand that this is also something we're supposed to learn for, like Rabbi Kiva, on those three levels. What is the message that we have as a, we'll start, the, we'll start it up, uh, backwards on a national level? Very interesting is that suddenly Israel has become very isolated from all the other countries in the world, as all the other countries have become. Suddenly, countries have become very isolated. It used to be that there was a big connection. In fact, it wasn't so long ago that we praised, and we spoke about it, I think, in this year as well, that we praised the world for coming on, Yom on the Holocaust Day, that we had 40 world leaders that came to Israel, and look, Israel is now on the geopolitical map, and we're, we're accepted on a, on a wide level, and, look, you know, and, and just to compare that to the commemoration of the Holocaust Day, that we don't have to go too far back in history to see how ostracized the Jewish people were, how ostracized the state of Israel was. And suddenly we're now back to each community for itself. I was thinking about this recently, I was talking to my office in New York, that uh, this is a worldwide uh, problem, the, the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. Everybody's affected, it hasn't skipped out any country, any area of the world. And yet each country has become very, very isolated into itself, We've become very insular. How do we look at it to ourselves? What, is it, what do we learn from the, about the Jewish people? What are we supposed to learn from this? What are we as the, as the state of Israel? What are we as the, as, as the Jewish state in the world? What do we learn? How do we become? How do we survive as a state? How do we look at these things that, are, that, are, that have created a specific national entity, which is maybe very unusual to what we had before, what we had, what we've had in other uh, 
other in in in, in a recent history. As I said before, you know, the, in the same way that the jokes are only about the jokes because that we can do, and not about the solution because that's on their hands. That limited need, that's already something else. Let's bring it back down to us, community. We used to, it used to be easy. How do we community? We come to shul. I think many of us. What's my community? The guys I go to Duffin with. What do I know about them? Often very little. What do I know about the people in my, in my minion? What do I know about the people in my shul? What, I, I'm sure that you have the cinema experience that I have, is that many times, and I had it this week as well, you go to a shiva, and it's an opportunity to actually meet someone who you know well, who you've Duffin with for maybe many years, and yet I don't really know what they do. I don't know what they're, who they are. I don't really know what their, inter what their uh, life looks like. I don't know what their history was. And I often find, and I'm sure you've all had a very similar experience, that when I go to sit shiva, I go to see someone sitting shiva, I go to Nechem, and I, and I uh, ask the person, tell me about the person that's like, you find fascinating stories. People have had incredible histories that we don't really know about. Why is that? Maybe because our communities have become functional. They're only the 10 people I get for the Dutton. And maybe now that we're not doubling together off, or we're, and we're definitely not, not, not doubling next to each other, we now have to create a new understanding of what community is. What is the importance of community? The idea that we're having now a shield in this, in, this, uh, in this sort of community, in a virtual community, um, that's already understands that, that communities is greater than just 10 people getting to meet at the Duff. There was a nice uh, 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 funny that was sent out, I'm sure many of you saw it, that uh, at least at the point in which we could Dovin, we were allowed to go to Dovin Minion, but to have to stand two meters away from each other, they said, well, this definitely has solved the problem of speaking in shul because no one's speaking to each other because we're standing so far away from each other. We can't, now there's no speaking in shul. So uh, that's it. Let's just think about that. To think about what does it mean to be community? How can we have interaction when we can't have physical interaction? How can we have real uh, expressions of of closeness when we're not physically close. And I saw a nice idea, and I shared it with my shul last Shabbat, and I will share it with you as well, that the idea that every person I can't shake hands with means I have to pick up the telephone to somebody else in the community. Every time that I can't, have a, I can't hug someone and say Shabbat Shalom, I now have to care about someone else in the community who's, who's, uh, who needs, who, who's in needy. I.e. that we can, trans, we can transfer what we had as a community to make real connections. The idea that we can't shake hands doesn't exempt us from creating real connections. To bring it even closer to home, what does it mean for myself? What does it mean for myself that for many, for many of the people who are working the world, we're now not working, we're now working from home. We're now not able to function as we were before. We're not able to do things that we want. Many of our plans, the great plans of man and men, uh, 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 we, our plans have been dashed. We now, what does it mean? What's important for us? What is it that really expresses who we are? These three spheres, when we have a danger in the world, suddenly become really re very relevant. The national sphere, the geopolitical sphere, that's a little bit out of our, of our um, ability to control. The communal sphere and even more importantly my personal sphere who what does it mean about me what is this time that i can think what is it that's important just the consciousness of of where do i put my hands how often do i wash my hands a day how do i keep clean how do i keep a sanity how do we things that are what what is who am i and the <clears throat> you know this amazing idea and i'm sure and, and this will close with that I'm sure that we all have been moved by is to see people continue getting married in the most unusual circumstances. And that women and the couples, I get a call the other day. I was on the way to a shiva house. Um, we went during the day to make sure very few people were there. This the Nachem. We went there and Komi Nachem and left. And a woman called me and said, you know, I, we're supposed to get married next week. But we're worried that there's they're going to close everything up. There's going to be a complete uh, seger, a complete isolation. We're not going to be able to leave. We want to get married this week. What should we do? And I said to the woman, you know, it's a complex situation to bring your wedding early and to have 10 people there and not to have all of the, uh, the regular, normal expressions of a wedding. But you will have a story to tell your great-grandchildren. 
this is the way we got married. You know, there's something that you've been to many weddings, listen to it. There'd be 500 people. They, called the, there was the, they served this food and that food, and there was this band and this photographer. But your wedding, everybody will remember it because this is what's really important. Because at the end of the day, the 500 people there and the 500 shekel of plate and the, the 10,000 shekel plate band and the 10,000 shekel photographer is not really what's important. What's really important is that we continue with life, is that we have made a decision that we're continuing living, that we're continuing living on three levels, on a national level, Am Yisrael Chai, on a communal level, we complete communities. We're having this share in this on, on Zoom. We're having this share in this in this unusual virtual community. On a personal level, we make a decision that we're continuing, that we understand the danger, we're conscious of the danger, and we're not going to let it change who we are as people. We understand our priorities, and that I think is fascinating. It's connected to Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, who's at this disastrous point in, in the Jewish in Jewish history. Let's be honest much worse than our situation today. And Rabbi Akiva understands, look at Madai. Madai, who were terrible people, who did terrible things to my, to my community, to my, to, my, to my people, to the Jewish people. Madai understood that there is three levels of danger. There's a national level of danger. We have to be careful on that. We have to make sure that we have our counsel in the field that these spies can't hear. There's a communal level of danger or as Rabbi Cook calls it, a family level. And therefore, when we shake hands, we have to be careful not to transfer diseases from one to other. And there's a personal level of danger. There's a personal level of how do we cut the meat? How do we prepare food at home? How do we live at home? And therefore, Rabbi Akiva said, if they were conscious of that, there's also a solution for all those three levels. There's a personal solution. I'm going to continue. There's a communal solution. We're going to teach the Talmudim in the Darum. And there's a national solution. A solution. We're going to continue believing in Mashiach. We're going to be believing that it's going to get better. So uh, I leave you uh, temporarily with uh, the blessing of Rabbi Akiva that we should learn from Madai as well. We should learn from the Madians the concept of our national responsibility, our communal responsibility, and our personal responsibility. We have an opportunity over the next few weeks mm -hmm. to understand what is that, what are our priorities are, what's really important on all of these levels. Mm -hmm. And Besad Hashem, Eti Le Yaakov, many a it is a difficult time for Yaakov and for the Yaakov, the whole world. And from it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will save us. And we should meet again, Besad Hashem, not virtually, but actually very soon in Yerushalayim. Shalom, shalom.